Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Hello, I'm Peter O'Toole and today I spoke with Dan Davis from the University of Manchester about being professor at such a young age. I think it's actually really important that we always remember that these titles are, are a bit nonsense. The importance of technical staff as revealed by the Wellcome Trust survey. Technicians in labs might be made to feel sort of like second class citizens and, and there's no way that that, you know, we've got to change that. And for the worst joke ever told in this podcast series so far. No, I, I'm not a comedian. All in this episode of The Microscopists. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole. Today I'm joined by the great Dan Davis from University of Manchester and The Microscopists. Dan, hi, how are you doing? Hi, Peter, how are you doing? Uh, I, well, I, I just asked you that question. You can't ask, ask the same question back without answering it. I'm good, how are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I'm, I'm doing well. What about you? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually very well. And thank you for joining me today. I've got to say, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Oh uh, dear, okay. All right, Pete. That's a, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know whether <laughs> I don't know whether that sounds good or bad. Uh, good for me. Maybe trouble <laughs> for you. We'll find out as we go along. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I remember the first time we met. You know, there's so many people I, I meet. I, some, people are re- some people are really memorable. And it was back, I think, 2000 two ish i think back at a uh, room it was actually it was an rms conference i think it was the first royal microscopical society conference i ever went to organized by justin malloy in oxford at the time and i remember you being there as this young really big name immunologist and you must have been what 32 33 at the time and yeah, cruising towards your professorship which you got at the young age of 35 and yeah i knew of you I heard you talk, and there you are, casually lounging around in your T-shirt, rack sack on your back, looking as casual and as laid back as ever. And do you know what? You haven't changed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I can't recall. I, I certainly remember hanging out with you in conferences. I'm not sure I can precisely recall that one exactly. But, I mean, everyone, everyone much more informal when we meet at conferences, right? It's not just me. Yeah, no, I, I would have been super casual then. But I, I, know, <laughs> I think back in back then, the old guard was still quite formal. Uh, yeah, if you think about that, Tony Wilson would have been there. Uh, even Justin was there. So, and they were all certainly shirt wearing. I mean, there, there is something in that, isn't there? Like, it's not just uh, it's not just an anecdote from a meeting that you and I are at. It's also true that in general, in society. Uh, you know, scientists used to be all in all in suits, all male dominated. Uh, or, well, okay, there were obviously great women throughout history and science, but that it has. You know, the people that do science has changed dramatically uh, in the course of our careers, and and also the yeah, the chit chat, the banter at meetings. Things were a lot formal, uh, uh, a lot more formal, I think, in in bygone times. And it's true, I think, that now. Yeah, now things have relaxed. People are much more themselves in meetings. The personalities uh, are quite colourful in, in a lot of these uh, uh, meetings we go to. So, yeah, it's probably true in general that there's been a kind of change over the last few decades in, in how formal people are at scientific events. You know, I, I've just realised the irony that here I am sitting wearing a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine it's, like, it's fine it's not like it's yeah. not fully buttoned up and there's yeah. no tie on it <laughs> and it's not beige <laughs> very good peter very good yeah. it's certainly the color back then anyway so dan you know you're you're very modest you're not going to talk too much about it but you did become a professor at the age of 35 uh, which is very young how daunting did you find that well, uh, it, I, I think that, you know, I think that when, when you're younger, you, you sort of 
or at least for me, I didn't think about it as much. I didn't think about uh, career structures or titles or or career progression as much as uh, maybe I'm forced to now, or, or, or other young people I come across often think about. Like I think that I think that um, you know I, I did physics first. I went to the USA and did and did then did biology, and it was just part of the momentum and excitement of what we were doing. Uh, and I think the reason that I, one of the key reasons I wanted to, because you have to apply to be a professor, you have to fill out a form essentially, then they judge it. So there has to be some active thing. It doesn't, none of this stuff just sort of lands in your face. So, and I think one of the things I remember thinking was that the, the titles that people have are useful for how others perceive you. So that was why it was going to be useful to me. So if students are looking to do their PhD in a lab, if I'm professor, whatever, for whatever reason, even though I know all the titles are nonsense, I would, I would be seen as a better bet to do my, someone might want to pick my lab to do their PhD project in. So in that sense, the titles can be important, but I think it's actually really important uh, that we always remember that these titles are, are a bit nonsense. Uh, uh, the, you know, the, it's really academic life is full of race to gain status, and and I think it's quite important that we uh, remember that we're we're all in it together. We're all trying to discover something important. We're all trying to uh, uh, push forward our knowledge, produce things that are benefit to society. You know, you know these titles lecturer senior lecturer reader professor or whatever it is in the u.s assistant professor i mean yeah you have to go through the motions but you know they're, they're not they're not that crucial <laughs> i think that's brought two important things forward actually firstly you know, I, i'm even losing my train of thought listening to you damn you man <laughs> <laughs> and, you know some people when they get their professorship actually they feel as though they've made it and they take their foot off the pedal you know they've got the status and they'll sit back uh, which certainly hasn't happened to yourself and i guess because you don't recognize the status particularly you are research driven and and the most successful out there are but it doesn't matter because you keep going uh, and that's hard to keep that momentum at all times you know yeah i don't think you know all the people that you meet you know you mentioned all these conferences we go to uh, all the people that we meet in these uh in scientific meetings the people that are that that you see give a great talk and it's all exciting or, or people you meet and they're colorful they have lots of things about them as well as the sun you know i don't think that they're too fussed about their title or status uh you know so it's true being a professor is good you know you, you get you get uh you get noticed as being a professor but it's also true that it's total it's, it's it's just a madness all these titles and 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 you know we need to everyone has to be aware of, i mean there, there are obviously practical things about the, the, that come with career progression like obviously getting a permanent secure job might be important in in some way uh, and and short-term contracts have their problems and the status of technicians in labs for example might be another area where there's work to be done to to make that uh how it should be but the but the but the you know titles like professor are you know neither here nor there really uh yeah yeah i i, I might get into trouble what i'm going to say now so hopefully you just won't need editing out afterwards you mentioned the technicians in labs and obviously I, I i'm in a service where all my staff are classed as technicians i would argue they're more research uh, almost career postdocs but technology bias rather than really driving behind one subject all the time and i you know i think that's a really good career path it suits them uh they are very successful in what they do it's not wrong and yet the word technician still has this stigma about it in some quarters yeah, yeah, no, I totally, uh, I'm totally on board with that. And uh, yeah, the Wellcome Trust did a survey of how of various attitudes within the structure of science at the beginning of the year. And one of the things that came up was also was true that I think it was right that we need to. There are examples where technicians in labs might be made to feel sort of like second class citizens, and, and there's no way that that you know we've got to change that. Uh, there are several things about science that we need to 
that we need to work on. Obviously, uh, diversity uh, is, a, is a crucial issue, but, but there are other more nuanced issues within science very specifically, which would include things like the status of technicians in labs. It is, it is hard to, to, to get it right because if you, like, if you give people full-term contracts, permanent jobs right off the bat, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe there's an argument that people won't stay fresh and keep, and keep, uh, keep up the momentum and drive that's needed to, to, to keep us pushing forward knowledge as, in the best way we can. But equally, you've got to acknowledge that people have got very complicated lives outside science and, and, and short-term contracts definitely have problems. Now, this conversation is going completely different to as I thought. Thinking about those stresses of the short-term contracts, I think if, you, if they had longer term or more permanent positions, it would also maybe help the integrity of publications. I think there is a pressure for people to cut corners, be economical with the truth with some of their results. And ultimately, a lot of them get caught out. But I do worry that some of the scientists out there are so eager to get the next big publication that they do massage, ch cherry pick. I, I don't want to be disingenuous. To, 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 that's not the right, you know what I mean, to anyone. Uh, but I do think that culture does encourage in a minority, a very small minority, but it is important to acknowledge. Well, I, I mean, I think one of the things I'm quite passionate about saying is, is that we're not in the business of publishing. Uh, that we're, we're trying to make scientific discoveries and that is our priority. Uh, and because of the, you know, because of because science has become so structured as a as a career, which is a result of so many people doing it, you know, like you said, right in the beginning, uh, people used to be more formal, and that's true. And they, but there also used to be a lot less people doing science. Uh, and right now, I mean, there's any number of people doing science. If I put out a job advert for a postdoc. I think the last one I did, I had like 150, 200 applicants, you know, and I'm, half of them, I'm pretty sure are going to be great postdocs, if not all of them. That's right? because you're a professor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the structure the, 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 uh, of science makes it that we do have this intense focus on publications. Uh, and I don't know what exactly the right way out of that is, because it is true that publications are very, very important, but really it's the science itself that's important. And, and it, you know, sometimes we can get caught up, even in my own lab, uh, we can get caught up in the sense that, you know, we need to publish, we have to publish what we've got, even though, even though I know it, it, it would be better if we carried on for a bit and nailed this or that part of the of the story but i know also we have to publish i know also that the that the contract of that person is three years four years so we have to publish their stuff and then we need to because they need to get the next job etc so there's all these all these things get caught up in the way in which we do science and, and it's become it's become very complicated but you know we just got to stay uh talking about that and we and i think you know lab heads would instill their their own ethos within their own lab about that. And, and I think most of the great scientists, not me, the great scientists, I mean, they would, they would be telling their lab team, you know, to fight. In fact, when you spoke to uh, Jennifer Lippicott Schwartz in this series, um, she said that it's such a huge effort to get, to, to produce a paper that you only really want to do that when you've got something really important to say. I'm paraphrasing exactly what she said, but it was that, it was that sense. Now, you know, I, I asked someone else as well, and one of their favourite publications, I think it took them nine years from the start, from the inception, to getting it published. They've published lots in between. Yeah. But that, that slow burner, it, it's, it can yeah, take a Yeah, some papers are, are a real uh, uh, slow burn, yeah. And there's, um, actually, in the, in the course of, uh, in, in the later part of my career, I've, I've, I've written a couple of books, and, and that involved interviewing uh, many tens of great scientists. And I remember interviewing uh, Pamela Bjorkman about, so she did the, with Don Wiley and Jack Stromer, did the crystal structure of, of a protein HLA2. And it, it did take her something like eight or nine years. I can't remember exactly. I remember asking her about what, what, what kept her going. 
through that. And it's really difficult because something like a crystal structure of a protein, I mean, nowadays you can do it quite easily, but this was uh, some time ago, the, the mid to late eighties. And um, uh, there's no kind of halfway moment where you've got a bit of a success. You've either got the, you've either got the structure of the protein or you haven't. And until you get to that point, you haven't like half discovered, you haven't really discovered anything. Right? <laughs> yeah, until you, you get there. Anything. So it takes great perseverance and it takes, uh, if, if there's anything about what might, uh, uh, I mean, there's all different kinds of people do science, but is there anything sort of general that emerges over the people that are very successful? It is, it is about, that is having a sort of inner belief that you're going to get there. And, and that sort of fuels the perseverance that you need. I, I love the fact that you dished structural biology saying it's easy now. They'll love you for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I would just take that quote. <laughs> Well, I mean, it is uh, easier and, and now they make it more complicated for themselves by trying to look at lots of more uh, new or complicated structures and interactions and whatnot. Yeah, well, that, that's taken into the cryo EM. They're, they're only doing that. So they take all the research money to themselves. No, I am joking. <laughs> <laughs> Careful what I say again. Good grief. Yeah. So, you all, do you know what was interesting right at the start? You mentioned that your first degree was in Physics? Oh, physics, yeah, yeah, yeah. And here you are as a successful immunologist. That's quite a big shift in field. Yeah, yeah well, it wasn't, again, it wasn't like a, a sort of planned thing. Well, so, so I did physics. For, so I think, I think at a young age, I wanted to do science and, and physics was uh, what, what I wanted to do because it was laws that work across the whole universe. So what could be more important than than that what could be more fundamental than the way in which the whole universe works so that was what i had to work on uh and i really you know i loved it i loved doing physics at university and then went on to do my phd in physics but then i i think i actually just genuinely changed my mind that about what was important i thought that laws that work in the whole universe must be the most fundamental thing and then i literally changed my mind and thought actually life is even more fundamental than that even though you could only study life in one space one place within the universe still and I, and I think I also started to see that um that I could make a I might be able to make a better contribution to science if I started thinking about how life works because at least the type of physics I was doing uh, was a bit east I, I felt was a bit more esoteric and and I needed to get to where the action was which was in biology so so i decided i will switch from physics to biology after after my phd in physics i then went to study biology but then which aspect of biology i would study was a little bit more random than that so i simply wrote to lots of labs in the usa so i wanted to go to the usa because i also felt at that time that that was also where where the action was where lots of things were happening so i wanted to go to live in the usa for a while uh, and I simply wrote to basically famous people that were in a city that I thought would be fun. Uh, professors, yes. Yeah, well, <laughs> probably, yeah. So, uh, yeah, actually a couple of them won Nobel Prizes since. So I definitely picked, picked the right sort of people. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, to my surprise, I got quite a few letters uh, back from people that actually taking someone from physics into a biology lab was actually what quite a lot of people did want to do. They saw that there was something exciting about that. Didn't quite, especially in the US where labs can be quite large. So I, 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 even though I might be a bit of a risk as a physicist in a biology lab, there'll be a structure of 20 other people that are going to get them the papers they need anyway. So that's fine. So they can just take someone like me and see what happens. And so then, yeah, so then I switched into immunology and that was a little bit more random. Uh, but yeah, then I got into immunology. And then when I got there, uh, that was when I suppose I kicked off with the, with the kind of work that I'm very slightly known for in the immunology stuff. Very slightly known for, for goodness sake. <laughs> uh, I, I, think I, I think it's a key point. And do you know, so many people that I talk to, their careers have never been, they've never had a, a career, they, they've never known where they're heading. They, they've started typically in physics or chemistry and they've ended up in the field of biology through all sorts of convoluted routes and following their passion and the opportunity and finding where their strengths are and playing to their strengths and moving forward with it. 
but that is quite a big yeah shift. we've got to we've got to instill that in uh in young people today because i think as well we because of the structure of songs because it's become very competitive people do tend to go from degree to phd to postdoc to postdoc to fellowship to having their own lab in a, in a more linear way and it and it is you know we need to make sure people do retain the sense of it's kind of fun and fluid and you should be able to do stuff and that and that that I mean, it is hard i think it's all a consequence of there being a lot a lot of people doing science and that makes it harder to do that but yeah, so that's, uh, that's where we are. But, but we've got to try and keep it fun. <laughs> I, I will give a shout out. Certainly in the UK, the research funders are actually quite good at encouraging, switching disciplines and moving and using your expertise in a completely different area. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because also, uh, Peter, that's, that's, what, that's, uh, that's how you can get this illusion of creativity very easily. So if I'm coming in from physics and there's some bullshit, I'll just say... I remember, you know, I remember going into, um, so I was working with Jack Stromlander in Harvard University, with all these epic people doing, doing stuff. They were looking at, uh, it, it was a time when a particular type um, of immune cell uh, was, it had been discovered in 75, but the molecular details of how it really decided whether another cell was healthy or disease, that was all just coming out. Um, and I just said, oh, that looks pretty cool. Yeah, what happens if we heat up the cells a bit? <laughs> what are you, what are you, Jay? Well, they were like, what? What do you mean heat them up a bit? That's like crazy. And I was just thinking, oh, you know, well, when you get a fever, the, the thing, you know, the, the body temperature goes up. Let's just heat up the cells and see what happens. I mean, probably people have done this 50 years ago, but I didn't know. And then it actually turned out that, you know, the immune cells would, would suddenly recognize these uh, uh, cancer cells and other cells much more effectively when you when they were heated up a little, uh, to 41 or 42 degrees. And then, and then you know, I, I mean, I sort of didn't pursue that other people, but it did turn out much later that, you know, you get a very specific stress response induced in cells that lead to the upregulation of uh, proteins that are specifically put up at the cell surface when a cell is stressed out, when it's heated up. So there are, you, if you just come in from a different discipline, you just have, you might say wacky things that, are good good for you and good for the people that are working in that area as long as as long as you're all you know we were you know i made a lot of good friends at that time as well so as long as you're sort of bouncing around and it's all good natured you know you can it's really good for science to mix it up like that yeah so the beauty of naivety yeah yeah there's a lot of that in it i think i think it's really great to come in uh to a lab and be like What's that, Peter? You're flushing up so, on a, a picture. So, so Dan, you, you said you said you forwarded some pictures. So, so when I got into the uh, an immunology lab, um, uh, you know, so, so they were doing the sort of the stuff that immunologists at that time did a lot of, which is you'll you'll have a cell, uh, and, and a type of immune cell. They're working on natural killer cell. So these are these are just one of your white blood cells that are very good at killing. Uh, certain types of cancer cell and some virus infected cells um, and, and, and at that time they were looking at how does that type of immune cell see that another cell uh, is diseased and so the way that you you do that there are several ways you could do that what people were doing is you just sort of make antibodies against all the different random proteins that the NK cell might have, for example, and you find ones that might stop the killing. Uh, and then you know that that's sticking to something that might be really important. Or you could uh, genetically mess with the cell in some way and find versions of the cell that can't kill or can kill better. And that way you dig into the details of molecular recognition, how the NK cell sees that another cell is healthy or diseased. So I came into the lab uh, and I, I said, well, that is really amazing. Now we're, now we're working out, you know, that this protein sticks to this other protein and that then triggers the NK cell to know that that is a cancer cell. But why does it take 10 minutes for that to happen? What, what is the, actually going the, on? Yeah. What? The image for, for those listening to it, you've got, you've got the nice image of that recognition to start with and then the cell, well, not looking too good after 10 minutes really, is it? Yeah, so I just took these cells to the microscope facility, which as far as I, no one had ever, no one had ever been to this microscope facility. I mean, not from the, from where I, from the building where I was. So, I mean, uh, uh, and then 
just looked at these cells interacting. So that there you could see is a natural killer cell from someone's blood. It's sticking to another cell and it kills it within, within 10 minutes. So that then, although you have all, all the knowledge was building up around the details of which protein is important for all of this stuff to happen, there wasn't, an ob there wasn't a good sense of the space and time of that. What, what, what are, how does that play out over the few minutes that the cells are stuck together? And then it turned out that, um, so this was 95, 96, uh, 97. So the, so the GFP had just been uh, cloned. Um, Chalfi, who got the, Martin Chalfi got the Nobel Prize, uh, uh, along with uh, uh, Roger Chen and, and what Webb. And, and, and um, you know, so GFP was a, was a new thing at that time. And so putting GFP onto the end of the MHC protein, so one of the really important proteins in how immune recognition works, that's what I decided to do, um, to look at how this plays out over the few minutes of the interaction. Yeah, so then, so then I guess what, what you could see is that, you know, the GFP tagged protein sort of moved up to the contact between the cells. So to me, that was like super exciting, but it was, it's true that, you, you know, someone who knew what they were doing might have expected that because you could already, uh, it was already known that like when beads stick to a cell, they accumulate proteins at the contact. So, so I was get, I was like, oh, look at these super cool pictures. But m maybe other people would have said, oh yeah. I, I, well, I must say the image quality did get somewhat better than the first images that you had back in '95. <laughs> <laughs> so, then, but what was really surprising at that time was if you sort of used a, a, a confocal, so taking Z slices, I'm, and I mean, it's hard for me to know what the general field was. I just come from physics to biology, and it was really cool for me to do that. I don't know if around the world this was something people were doing or not really um but if you image down between the two cells then the different proteins were organizing themselves into sort of patterns and that then became the immune or immunological synapse so uh, avi kupfer um uh who's now at, at john hopkins he 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 did see that first before me he did that in t-cells uh mike dutson mike dustin um did similar work uh, to Avi, uh, and I did it in NK cells. And uh, I mean, my, my sense of it is that, I mean, I didn't really know, I didn't know about their work when I was doing that, but it did, but my, the, certainly my paper was after this. And, um, uh, and that, was a, that was really fun and really exciting to me. And, but I was very nervous about, about the whole thing. I didn't really, I saw on the screen, uh, uh, when you reconstruct the Z stack images from a confocal, I saw on the screen, that these proteins were not evenly distributing between the two cells. There was some pattern to that. I saw that, but I was also very worried that I was making it up in my head. Uh, and I wasn't, I wasn't at all confident that I was get, doing this right. So in one of the times I had my, my wife, I mean, uh, well she, she does do scientific things around, she was doing some uh, uh, genetic analysis work over the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, but she doesn't do anything like with, uh, like wet experimental science. Um, and so I had her come and sort of look at the pictures and do essentially do the experiment on the microscope with me just saying how the microscope works, you know, checking, does this, is this, am I making this up or does it look like there's kind of rings and, and splotchy patterns with holes and different proteins are going in different places. Uh, and then, yeah, so then I, I'm, so, yeah, I think a lot of science, uh, is about gaining confidence in what you're doing. And, and you know, Pete, with, with microscopy, this couldn't be more important because, you know, in microscopy, it's really hard to know what you're doing. You'll, you'll see all kinds of weird stuff. If you just look at, if you just look at a few cells bumping around, uh, you can ask a very specific question. You, know, you would have set up the experiment in some way that is trying to answer something. But out of the corner of that, movie you just took there might be something weird going on and and ha it's really hard to know whether you should investigate that weird thing a little bit more or it's just a bit weird or even or even did, did you just see that or were you just making that up right so i think microscopy is really psychologically difficult for those reasons um yeah or can be a rabbit hole as you start chasing something that was really really rare to see and you'll never replicate it again. So actually, even, even in those very early pictures that I took, I would often see a GFP tagged protein in one cell 
uh, end up in the other cell that I didn't put it in, right? So there'd be a fluorescent protein in one cell, the immune cell, let's say, and that, that other protein would swap over to the, and, and I would see that and I would say, oh, this is just, uh, it's just mad. I, I put it down to maybe the cells die, bits of dead cell moving around. I don't know. I just, I, I wasn't strong willed enough to know that <clears throat> that could be a really important phenomenon until I saw another paper show that. So Jonathan Sprint uh, had a paper in science that showed proteins move from one cell to the other uh, in these immune cell interactions. And then I thought, oh, well, I've been seeing that for years. Right, we need to seriously, we need to follow this up. And then that led to a little, a few years of, several years, in fact, of work that we did on how things are moving around between immune cells. And I still think that's an untapped area of immunology that cells aren't sticking to the proteins they make. They're swapping them about very commonly. Which kind of leads on, I, I, I will get off science in a minute and start talking about other things, but I guess talks onto the microtubules, which for the nanotubules, you're one of the first, or one of the co-discoverers so, of nanotubules. So, the, so, the, so these are the, yeah, so these are nanotubes. So these, these pictures were taken by Bjorn Onfeld. He now has his own lab in the Karolinska Institute as a professor there. But, but when he was in my lab, um, yeah, so we were working very deliberately on things swapping around between cells because I, I just had seen that myself. And my first PhD student, Leo Carlin, uh, dug into that in some detail and published a, a paper on that. And then, you know, we saw all these long, thin strands of membrane connecting these uh, immune cells to, to, together, and we called them uh, membrane uh, nanotubes. Uh, Hans Hermann Gerdes, who's sadly uh, died, uh, he he published a paper in Science on these on on structures that are very similar to this, or perhaps the same as this. Um, and we followed that up. Uh, I don't, I can't remember exactly a few a few months later, maybe a couple of months later, with a short paper saying that these structures are quite common. And again. It's one of those things in microscopy where you can see these things, right? So when I first gave talks on these thin strands of membrane between immune cells, I would always get someone in the audience saying, well, what, how are you? I saw that in like 1970, like, well, well, what are you doing? And I was like, yeah, I mean, it's not difficult to see strands of membrane that stick between cells. They're very common. But the issue is, the change in thinking is, is that really important? Is that doing something? Is that... Is that creating a mini synaptic structure at the tip of the nanotube that is sending a signal down the tether uh, from one cell to communicate over a long distance? Or is it even in some situations a sort of hollow tube and things are trafficking uh, from one cell to another? I mean, there has to be some gating mechanism to that because it can't be that cells are transferring everything from one cell to another. So it opens up, it's just a change in mindset that these strands of membrane are really, really important. But, you know, so that's, that's where we got, that's where we got with that. Which comes back to, you may have seen it in the 70s, but if you didn't study it or publish it, and back to <laughs> publications, then no one knows and, and no one's followed it and no one tries to understand it. Once you publish it, people try and understand it to a greater depth and see if it's relevant to their areas and stuff. Well, it also, it's also, uh, it, uh, uh, there's another nuance to all this, which is that, uh, which is really important for microscopy, which is that even if we discover that these strands can do this or that between cells under our, you know, super high powered uh, uh, laser based scanning microscope, you know, where and when is that happening in the body? So you've got to be a bit careful. So that is a, that's a huge challenge for all the cell biology that's going on. Um, exosomes is, is, a, is a good example of that. Lipid rafts was a, was a great one for that. Um, and these membrane nanotubes are in this category of a lot of stuff. They could, a lot of stuff could be happening in this way in which we can't easily dice, see inside the human body or inside an animal even. It's, it's, it's so, so there's a limit to our knowledge, which comes di very directly from a limit in the technology. So, moving on slightly from that, you went over to the States and I, 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 I don't know how old you were when you went there. You were in your 20s, I'm presuming, at this point, when you went over to the US. And you were obviously really keen to get over there. But how did you find moving to the US? Uh, so I, I absolutely loved it. So I went, um, 
I think I'd just turned 26, maybe I was 25, something like that. And I went to uh, uh, the US Harvard. I remember arriving in the lab. Um, I can, I can, it was a blizzard. I was in Boston. I mean, you couldn't see anything. It was just masses of snow everywhere. I was staying in the youth hostel there. Um, and, and I came into the lab. I mean, there was this lab bench with bottles and liquids and like, it was mad. I was like, what is, what is this? What is this like madness? Because I hadn't, I hadn't, you know, done anything in a biology lab, right? Yeah, so it was, yeah. I was like, well, where, where's, the, where's the laser table? You know, it was like, so uh, it was, but I, I was really excited about it. I was really excited about the opportunity. And I, I did work really, really hard in that initial time. So for, for at least the first six months, it was very long hours every day, seven days a week, really trying to throw myself into it. And that, it was a very formative time for me. And then, and then I sort of, I think also I started to gain confidence. I started to see that I could actually make a contribution. Uh, and once I started to see that I could make a contribution, I grew in confidence about what I could do. I threw myself even more into it. And also it was just the whole atmosphere. You know, there was a lot of very driven, good postdocs around me. Harvard itself, I mean, every week there'd be a lecture by a president a prime minister or, or someone who's won a Nobel prize and I'd be thrown going to all these stuff. I'd, you know, it was you, you, people are passing through the land. People who are, who are, you know, real leaders in science would just come to give a talk to our lab. And I was like, this is mad that we're like, this guy could be selling out to like 600 people. And here he is in our lab talking to us over a bunch of donuts for like to, to, to the 20 of us in the lab. And that, and that was just, I love that. But you just said there, you got presidents and prime ministers coming <laughs> over and, you know, and they know a lot about science. Did you really just quote that in the current climate? No, 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 no. They didn't know a lot about science. No, there were, there were great scientific leaders coming through, but there were also all this, the external program of, of, of stuff, you know, in the, in the Harvard campus. I mean, I loved it. It was just, just brilliant. So was it always aimed to be a short burn over there? Or did you think you might settle over there? Uh, so I stayed uh, in the US for three and a half years and then came back to set up my own lab. So I did just do one postdoc before setting up my lab. I, uh, I would have stayed there, I think. Um, the, uh, but my girlfriend at the time in, in Boston, who, who came out from the, from the UK, and she's now my wife, uh, we, she, she wanted to definitely come back to the UK. And, and some of that was about if we have kids, then they want to be near the grandparents. And uh, it's a bit hard. That's, that's, that's the story we tell. The problem with these, some of these things is that's, 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 that's how I've said it. That's how she says it. But now I don't know, because that's the, that's the, that's, I, can, I know we say that. I can't actually remember, uh, you know, whatever it is 20 years ago, if that's absolutely definitely how I was thinking but I could have stayed in Boston. I know that I know that I definitely always have a great affinity for the the buzz and the the can-do attitude of, of of the of of the great labs in the US. I always I always have a great affinity to that. Um, yeah. So you've co you've collaborated with loads of people. You came back to Imperial. You obviously had close collaborations there as well. How do you? I, I've not asked this for anyone. How do you compare the culture in the research labs in the US compared to the UK? Well. I mean, you know, it, it, it's hard because I'm also thinking about when I was really working there was some years ago now. So it's a bit hard to know in general. Uh, but I do, I think that there's some truth to all the stereotypes around that, that in a sense that the US probably is a bit more competitive. It can be quite harsh environment, uh, but also there is a greater sense of a, of a can-do attitude. It can be true that people have huge labs with you know, 40 people. I mean, the lab I was in, it, uh, Jack Stromager had a lab of 20 where I was and he had another lab of 20 people uh, over at the medical campus of Harvard. So, so I think all those stereotypes are true and it suits some people and maybe doesn't suit others. I mean, I really thrived in it because I, I really just love the buzz of it. I mean, yes, people working very long hours, but I wanted to do that anyway. It was, it was just a really exciting time. So I, it's a bit hard for me to know in general because every, every, there's all different kinds of labs. There's a great diversity in who does science and how. Uh, but I think I think I I naturally, uh, uh, well, you know, so the, the model at the LMB, for example, will be very different. Where you, the labs tend to be much smaller, much more, much more focused, and and you know you can't argue that the LMB hasn't done 
enormous achievement throughout the history of science. So there's lots of different ways in which I think you can succeed. I mean, but what, what I think is also really paramount importance is you just stay focused on the actual science. You know, I, I, I'm, I would be wary of, of some structures where there is a tendency to empire build and you gain kudos by having lots of people, having lots of money, having lots of interactions. Uh, and so some of that's probably true in the UK and the US. So you've got to stay, as long as you're focused on that you're really, you know, the science you really want to do, there are lots of ways in which you can succeed in a fund. I, I can see the appeal over a short burn, three to three and a half years. I, I, I was nearly, I nearly went over to the US myself uh, and then the job at York came up and well, oh, I can't say that because the in-laws are probably going to watch it, but it's both further away from the in-laws. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am joking, Pam, Jerry, completely. Uh, uh, so I saw the appeal for it, but actually I had a young child at the time uh, and the York offer was, was, was really good for myself. And it was about a work-life balance. And actually I, I really fancied the hard burn. Uh, so I came to York and just put the hard burn in the UK. Uh, and probably regret, I, I don't know, I don't regret putting in loads. It's very fuzzy. The family memories back at that time are very fuzzy because I put so much effort into my work. And so the work-life balance was probably a bit biased the wrong way at the time. Uh, but I think I had to do that to, to create the career that I wanted to create. So it is possible. But long term, uh, the life work, work life balance now back in the UK, you've got two children as well. Uh, how, how do you feel that that compares? And, and how do you balance that even today, your work life balance? Yeah, I think that's, that's uh, really hard. I, I find it really hard to uh, do everything I want to do, be a, a dad, a husband, a scientist, a writer, whatever I want to do. I find it hard to switch between all those and keep them all going. I think what I've learned to do uh, during my career, which is the one small uh, uh, morsel of wisdom that I might have for anyone uh, starting out is, is say no to the stuff you don't want to do. Uh, so if you can, if you can, of course. Um, you know, so a lot of people might take on more administrative work in a university, for example. I mean, being a head of department or, or and, and there's some great uh, reason to do that because you need, you want great scientists to be head of department and drive things. And you want people to uh, uh, be in positions of, of influence over, for example, maybe, maybe the grant, right, the grant uh, assessment process or you know, be heads of, of panels and things. And, and there's so much you can do actually in science right so from teaching to research to writing to 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 going out in the public to being on tv like there's so much you could do so you have to really you have to really decide what it is is the core thing you actually really really want to do and just stay focused on that because there's a lot of distractions and there's a lot of things come at you and also people are quite persuasive in trying to make you to do things uh oh, it'd be really good for you to be on this panel that panel the other panel or or, you know, you know, you, you've committed to doing reviews on three papers for uh, PNES and Nature, whatever, and then you get another one from Science. You're like, well, you know, I'm already reviewing three. Maybe I, I won't do that one. So I think getting that balance right for yourself is really important, and it's okay. It's okay to say no to some things. Yeah, I, 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 and especially if you reason it as well. So I'll always go back and explain why I have to say no. Yeah. Uh, I think that's good. But thank you for not saying no to doing the to doing today <laughs> well p i did actually in your first email say no and then you were very persuasive you said you sent me the email but it was at a time that i was like madly busy with something else and i thought you needed it to be done in 10 seconds i was like oh i can't do it. i thought you, and then then you clarified and said oh no then i thought okay yeah great this is great and actually Peter, i do think this is brilliant what you're doing i, I think it's really great to have uh uh a look at microscopists as people and see what everyone's doing and, I, and i've watched uh the well the three that are publicly available i know you've recorded some others but the ones that i've watched the ones that are probably available. it's great it's great stuff and i think it's great well done well done to you Pete, and the team behind you doing it otherwise i'm going to start to go red on there this lighting will never show it so stop there uh but thank you oh, yeah i wasn't you might run out you might run out of microscopists you might have to call it the microscopist and something else and something else and something else. And then you sort of, you know, trust me, I'll keep this swift so no one can actually copy it down. But no, the list is huge. 
Do you know it's amazing just how many times Oh, look, I just saw all the people that said no, and then you had me at the, on the, at the bottom there that was like, you know, the last resort, <laughs> scraping the barrel for someone to talk to. Yeah, no, I, was, I wasn't <laughs> going to give up on you, Dan. I, it was okay. really keen. That's to good. As well, because, you know, there's a lot of microscopy. So I, I would, you're an immunologist, first and foremost. You just, you know, done a lot of your research using the microscope, and I think that was uh, really good to have in there. So you talk about Eric, getting to Eric know Betzig, absolutely... well, Eric Betzig, who many of your listeners will know Eric Betzig, right? You've got the Nobel Prize. He, he, he's, uh, he always says that the, um, that the labels aren't that useful. You know, he says he won, he won the Nobel Prize for chemistry, I think, right? And, yeah. you know, he doesn't, uh, uh, what, you know, he's, he's a microscopist. Is he a physicist? Uh, he says himself, you know, he doesn't know a lot of chemistry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, he, I'm not saying that. I reckon he does. He, he says he doesn't. And yet he won the Nobel Prize for chemistry. So all these labels. Yeah, we, we have to get Eric to do one of these. Uh, that, that's yeah. a big target in my sights at the moment. So what do you do outside of work? What are your interests? Well, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I obviously I do write stuff. Uh, uh, writing is quite a significant part of my life. Um, so is that you, I, so would you count that as one of your hobbies? Is actually the the the, the writing itself? Because uh, well, I don't know. It's more than a hobby to me because it's quite important to me. So it's, I'd say it's more than a hobby, uh, but it's um, but it's certainly outside the normal. A lot of it is outside the, the sort of nine to five structure of, of whatever a normal day may or may not be. So the, so so the, the writing you put up here is, is I think your first publication uh, first. Book more gen This is more a layperson or general public. Yes, yeah, so that was my first the compatibility gene. Uh, uh, so that's that's yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, the first one I wrote. That's really the story of MHC. But you know, it's hopefully hopefully written in a more general way than that. Uh, and then I wrote <laughs> the book. Sell otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was important to me to to do that story. Um, it was important to me because it's about human diversity. Uh, essentially, that, that's that's one of the uh, most uh, wonderful things about the immune system that the the genes that vary the most between every single person on the planet is nothing to do with how you look like. Uh, it's to do with the immune system, and to me, that was such an important message that had to get out there that no one seemed to be writing about. So that's essentially what led me to write the book. Um, and then after that, I wrote another one called The Beautiful Cure. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, so this so. Beautiful book cover, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> great. In yellow as well. In fact, the ye have you got that on your bookshelf behind you? Uh, I can't, maybe. Is it, yeah, maybe. Probably. Yellow version? Probably I got the yellow version behind yeah. me somewhere, yeah. So, um, yeah, so then I wrote about the immune system in general. So this was, this was a book about, uh, you know, for both of these books, I interviewed, you know, 30, 40 people to, to get a sense of what they did. Um, yeah, so... Uh, so this book was a, is really about how the immune system works, hopefully for a general audience. Uh, it's done, yeah, I mean, it's been really fun for me to do that. It, it, you know, it's, it's, you know I don't, it's done quite well. It's been translated to 15 languages. It got to number four on all the books on Amazon. So it's, it's done quite well. But, and then, um, yeah, so writing is really important to me because uh, uh, I enjoy it. It gives me a chance to, to think about things in a broad way. Um, and also I find that the act of writing by articulating things in, in writing it, I, it generates new ideas. It generates me, it, it helps the, the thought process. So, so I love doing that. Um, you know, and then outside that, I mean, uh, yeah, I have two teenage kids. So, we, you know, we do stuff with them and stuff. I generally find uh, <laughs> caffeine, sleep deprivation and alcohol is the best way to get inspiration. <laughs> Freeze the mind of all the shackles of everything else that you've been drummed into <laughs> you. That's it. So thinking about your books, moving on here, what is the fa your favourite publication, whether you've authored it or co-authored it? Um, how many am I allowed? Just one. I'll, I'll give you two. I'll give you two. Is it just uh, one? And why? Just briefly. Uh, all right. Well, I suppose the first, the, the, um, my publication of, of the end natural killer cell immune synapse was was something I was proud of. I was proud of at the time. Uh, it felt like I really contributed something that was that was useful. Um, uh, that was in 1999. 
the dis the discovery of nanotubes um, uh, or the you know, the co-discovery of nanotubes i guess so uh, i was proud of that because it was I, I felt it was novel it was new it was something that uh, could be really important uh, and that was that was when i was so the, so the first paper was my i was doing the work in the lab but these other papers around nanotubes were done by many great postdocs and students in my lab team bjorn onfeld uh, stephanie swinsky and Chavon and, and several others uh, Led, led that work and so I'm I am proud of doing that and then all, and then it is true that writing those two books and I'll have a third one out next year so the writing writing books um I'm proud of because because in a way one of the you know it's, it's, it's something you do that's that has a uniqueness to it so one of the really great struggles for any scientist I think is that Although you're going, to, you're 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 pushing, you're you're giving up a lot of your life to make this contribution to push forward the knowledge. Sometimes it's just a case that you, if you didn't do that, someone else would have done it anyway. In, maybe in six months' time, maybe in a year's time. Whereas when you're writing books uh, and you're putting your blood into that book, uh, there's there's something about the fact that you know no one else would have done it or done it in that way that that is more there's a little bit more of you in that um so so that so i am proud of those of the books i mean i'm not saying that they're great books i'm just saying that i'm proud of having to manage to do that no oh God, look how well received they are they're hugely well received and oh actually i i, I need to draw up another picture thinking about your book so obviously this this has gone mainstream it's not just amongst the scientific community and so this is you at the Hay Festival, is that correct? And, and oh yeah, we, we, this is obviously an international audience. Can you explain the Hay Festival and who you're sitting with here? Oh yeah, well, so in this particular picture you've got there, that's Adam Rutherford, who does. He's well known in the in the UK for his uh, 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 work on on radio, TV, and he's also published several books himself. And uh, I mean that that I am I I, I love that. Uh, that interaction, you know, I really, I do strongly think that science should be part of our culture in, in a very general way. Um, and so I do really enjoy being part of the Hay Festival is, is the most favorite event that we go to every year. We've been going, my, me and my family have been going every year for at least the last 10 years. Uh, initially, we just, we just went as just, just to enjoy it, just to have fun. It's like a, 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 about a 10 day long thing with I don't know how many lectures, 600 lectures, let's say, probably a lot more, uh, you know, several tents. It's like a, you know, it's a real festival. I think something like 250,000 people go every year. Um, and I mean, This it, isn't a music festival, is it? This is a well, it does have music in it, but it's true that most of it is about talks and ideas. And I've seen, you know, lots of Nobel Prize winners go, lots of uh, politicians go, lots of science, scientists, science is a significant part of it. There's a lot of, uh, great fiction writers people it's it's really i love it and i love that it's, kind of thing. i love the interactions i've always wondered at a book festival if everyone just sits around and just reads a book quietly completely different to a music festival yeah no it's really it's fun it's, it's like hugely interactive yeah it's hugely interactive uh and uh <laughs> yeah i mean and, and it, you know it's so i initially used to go a lot just just to have just because it's so much fun uh, and now, but now also because I do stuff in it and I'm chairing events and giving my own talks. So now we, I get a little bit behind the scenes. I mean, I'm not like immersed in it in any, in any profound way, but, 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 you know, at least getting, you get to go to the green room and, uh, and then you meet, you know, you can meet all these people that are quite inspirational. I love that. And I love going to festivals and, uh, um, I've done things at other other more music orientated festivals, and I, and I love the engagement, the interaction with people. And the interaction with people is what makes what makes it great fun. Both science and and literary events and, and music events, all of this stuff. So yeah, it's a huge part. It's a huge part of what I think is really uh, good fun to do. So I'm sorry, moving on swiftly because you said that you've got all sorts of polit politicians and everything. And yet, I guess if the politician doesn't come to you, you go to it. So this is a picture of you outside Number Ten Downing Street. So. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. So this, you know, so. Prime I Minister think, residence. I think you know. So certainly not. You know, we published. Uh, you know, certainly not because of our latest research. Unfortunately, I mean, I don't. You know, I guess the government isn't necessarily hanging on um, uh, our latest scientific paper, but because I, but I think because I wrote books that are hopefully reasonably accessible about how the immune system works and and, and things like that. I have I have ended up uh, 
getting immersed in, in other things. And, 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 I, and I enjoy that. And I also do think that it's important for science and scientists uh, to interact as widely as possible with, with the world that's out there. Um, it's not that I, have, I don't have any influence whatsoever. This was just uh, an event uh, at Downing Street uh, uh, that happened uh, in the beginning of the year. Um, but, but, the, but it's that interaction and that engagement which, he, which comes from... I mean, it was very scary in the beginning. You know, when I first thought I wanted to write a book, I was really quite scared about how others would view me, which is obviously uh, uh, a bit of a silly way to look at things. But, um, but I did think that all the scientists might be angry. They might be angry for any number of reasons. Firstly, they might think, well, if you've got time to sit around writing books, then obviously you're not 120% on the research, so why are we going to fund your next grant? And I also thought that... Um, you know, so I was a bit worried about how this would all play out. But I have to say that now that I have done these kinds of things, it's, it couldn't be more wonderful. I mean, I do, still do get some uh, uh, antagonism from other scientists over things, over sort of public outreach work. But overall, it's been hugely positive. Uh, and, I, and I like in, interacting with everything that's out there. I have to point out that you stood outside 10 Downing Street in a suit. Yeah, I wore and a suit. So I've, I think I have to check. I think that's the same suit that, you know, I have a suit. I have a suit. I, I have three shirts that are all pale blue. I have a suit. And uh, I think that's the same suit I've worn for, I don't know how long, but I do. I did put on the suit for that event. Well, I did tell you at the start, <laughs> you haven't changed. <laughs> <laughs> but the suit was a very different compared to normal t-shirts. <laughs> Jumper. Do, do you own a lot of suits, Pete? No. <laughs> no. no I, I, I think I probably have two that fit properly. Yeah, I've got a lot that don't fit. That's the problem. Early 90s style that are a bit too big on me now. And <laughs> When after lockdown, I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be a bit worried about getting into any suit. <laughs> <laughs> We've gone through that. So, you're probably, quick one. What is, how much time do you now spend in the lab? Oh, uh, the actual doing the pipetting? Yeah. Oh, I hate it. Oh, I've always hated lab work. Oh, so I never, uh, I never did, I never really wanted to do lab work. So, um, yeah, so, you know, so I went to the US and did this postdoc for three and a half years. Obviously, that was all intense. That was all lab work. I mean, I, then when I came back, I did do experiments for some years, but I, I'm not a huge fan of, doing the actual experiments. For me, it's about thinking about the experiments. What do they mean? What, what should we do? What will we do next? Is that well controlled? How's it going to work out? It's, it's, the, the, it's an intellectual feast to have all these people come to me with, with, with what they're doing and discussing that. And I've never, never really been, a, I don't need to be, I don't feel a need to be preparing the, the, the samples myself. Um, and, I, and I've never, I did, I never really enjoyed that. I always enjoyed the, the thinking and the brainstorming and the buzz of it and the, and the, what does it mean? And that's, that's what I, that's what I, that's always the way I wanted to have a lab. So you don't miss the lab. That's blatantly obvious then. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely don't miss the lab. So lab, no lab. So you're definitely office rather than the lab. So what about US or UK? <clears throat> Quick answer, which is best, US, UK? They, they just both have different uh, things about them. But right now, right now, looking at the leadership in each country, uh, well, yeah, that's true. You might want to think Germany? about some... Yeah, you, option? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, okay. But, you know, London or Manchester? What? London what or Manchester? Oh, well, that's also tricky. So uh, I missed... Oh, my I, God, I, you was bad as a politician. Never I love, you know... The art and culture and buzz of London is second to none. I absolutely love it. And I desperately miss it in Manchester. But in Manchester, uh, you know, the air's a bit cleaner. We're right next to the Peak District. So it's beautiful. Uh, and there's a slightly different tone uh, to when people come in and out of work. They haven't just done a hectic commute on the tube. It's a little bit more relaxed. So there are pros and cons. I, I actually genuinely love them both. I'm not going to ask my next question. Because what is think, it? What is it? Well, you, you, research or author. And we have to be so careful because you said you met with some antagonism. And I think it's true. Any celebrity scientist immediately seems to polarise the science community between those who think they're doing a great service and great work and others that think it's almost like turning to the dark side. Yeah. And 
I think it's really harsh because they're great communicators. Uh, yeah, I think I think actually, um, especially as as uh, as our, as people's journeys in science progress, everyone does broaden what they do to some extent. You know, you start off uh, just doing your experiments in your lab as a PhD student. Then you broaden as a as a postdoc. You 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 know you supervise others and you broaden what you're doing. Then as a PI, you now have quite a lot of collaborations, disparate projects. And then as your time as a PI goes on, you often tend to also broaden what you do. You would interact with, uh, for example, become get on panels or national committees. You would have set the agenda uh, in various strategic things, either in your university or with industry or with. So everyone broadens what they do, and so. So it's definitely important to me that it's not an either or thing, that it's, uh, you know, I, I, I want to be a, a, I want to do research. That's totally top priority to me, but it's also true that I take writing quite seriously. It's not, I'm not here just to piss about. Okay, so I'm going to very quickly, I want to get to know you a bit better now. So DVD or cinema? Or, or stream it at home and cinema? Oh my God, how old fashioned DVD? Stream at home or cinema? Cinema, but not with COVID. Okay. okay. <laughs> film or TV? 120% film. Phil, what's your favourite film? Oh, I don't know. I used to say Dead Poet Society, but again, it's kind of a reflex. Uh, so I don't know. I'd have to think about it more. I also love 2001. Dead Poet Society what is what I often say is my favourite film. Favourite Christmas film? Oh, I've got no idea. But the, very recently... Uh, my son, my son, for the first time, watched Die Hard uh, with us. And that that's a Christmas kind of, film. That's kind of fun. <laughs> Die Hard, it's one of the best Christmas films. That and Love Actually, I think 50-50, I'm not sure which <laughs> I prefer. And you can't get much more contrasting than the two, can you? Eat in or eat out under normal times? Uh, eat in. Cook or wash up? Oh, just stick it in the microwave and hopefully it's in a disposable bowl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I haven't got a comeback on that one. Okay. <laughs> got, no, no, this is going to be a real challenge. What's your funniest science joke? Oh, I don't have one. I don't have a science joke. Me. <laughs> <laughs> what about the funniest joke just in general? Oh, a man walks into a bar and said, ouch. It was an iron bar. Oh my yeah. god, that's so old. I know. I can't, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a comedian. What? what? My, my children will up, love it. Who came up with these questions? Is what I want to know. What? Did I only you... told my child. I, I told my youngest son that joke only this week. Yeah. I mean, well, well I don't know. You know, if you, if you got, if, not, if we not got questions from the audience, I'm sure they'd be better than this, Pete. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Two. Because oh, we are out of time. So, oh. very quickly. What what what's the next big science question to solve in one sentence? Uh, I think it's I think it's about human diversity. Well, there's so many. I mean, there's sleep, there's aging, but but also I think uh, diversity is actually really important. We we don't have a good handle on on what the differences between people really mean in, in especially in, in immune systems and health. Uh, there's a you know there's a lot to go, and it's going to be uh, culturally very important to think about this in a deep way <laughs> I'm still thinking about your bar joke I bet you did the worst job I bet you got better jokes from every other person the first time you. I've asked that question <laughs> oh, hopefully the last <laughs> I'm, I'm going to keep that one are oh, you going to keep it in okay okay <laughs> what's the uh, <laughs> what what tech what, what technology needs to be developed to help you move forward What's the next big technology development that you need to help solve and move forward? Uh, well, the, the, the biggest bottleneck in, in the type of thing we do is, is like I alluded to before, it's where it's, I mean, there are two things. What, it's the complexity of what we look at is still a problem. We're still very often looking at individual cells, groups of cells, and it needs to be a more physiological environment that we're tackling these questions in. But really what we need is nanoscale imaging uh, in 3D in, in, in an animal or a human, which is a pipe dream. But don't forget, when your 
career of my career started. It would have been a pipe dream to have a white light laser source. It would have been a pipe dream to have nanoscale imaging pretty much routine in, in all of the universities. So, you know, these pipe dreams can happen in, in years, decades to come. It takes a spark, a few, you know, some of these people that we mentioned during this, the people that develop super resolution microscopy are truly inspirational. So, you know, I, I, I can't do that kind of, that kind of level of step change. Uh, that, that's, that's where we've got to be going. No, I think, yeah, nothing is impossible, I don't think. It just takes time and money. <laughs> and, and it may take many centuries or more, but <laughs> I, so I think we'll get there, especially on that front. Dan, our time is up. I'm really sorry. Gosh, we could do another hour. I had loads of questions I didn't get through, but do you know what? It's been a great chat with you, Dan. Thank you for catching great. up. Great. All right. Thanks so much, Pete, and hope to see you in person sometime soon. Yeah, Dan, brilliant. Thank you very much. Take okay. care. Cheers. Bye. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.